When it comes to sin, people deal with it in all kinds of different ways. Some people deny it. Some people try to justify it. Some people hide it. Some people relish in it. But the authentic believer in Jesus Christ and dwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be convicted over their sin, not try to hide it, but confess it to the Lord. They're not going to live a life of continuing or habitual sin, but they're going to live a life for Jesus. The authentic believer in Jesus Christ is sensitive to the sin that's in their life. Join us today as we look at this message from 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, a message in our authentic series entitled Sensitive to Sin. Take your Bibles with me this morning. Let's turn to the book of 1 John together. We'll be in 1 John chapter 1 today. And we're starting something new. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at a sermon series that um, we're calling Authentic. And the idea behind Authentic is, is that we want to be authentic followers of Jesus. When I was in high school, I took two different trips to New York City. They were class trips. And I remember that I and my friends made my teachers very nervous because we were attracted to characters, you know. We were bumpkins from Georgia going to New York City. And there's, I don't know if you know it or not, but there's crazy people in New York City. And we were very attracted to those kinds of people. If it was street preachers in Times Square or dancing buskers in, in Central Park, we wanted to talk to those people and we were drawn to those kind of characters. One of the stereotypical characters that I was drawn to in New York was the guy who has the trench coat full of watches or the, um, you know, has them all up his arm, you know, can interest you in a watch, sir, you know, and it was fun to, to, to dicker back and forth with him. And so, I don't, listen, I felt like it was a pretty good deal. I bought a Rolex for $10 on the streets of New York City. And, um, and, I thought, I thought it would be, like, I, when I got back home, I gave that to my grandfather. I thought he would get a kick out of that, so I gave this watch to Pawpaw, and um, so, and he loved it. He wore it for years. He wore that, that $10 Rolex, uh, and so he goes, to the, he goes to the doctor one day, and his doctor noticed his watch and said, oh, I, I like that watch. I, I've got one just like it, and the doctor held up his watch, and it was the, ex the exact same model. You know, it was the exact same model. Everything about it looked the same. And, and Papa told him, you know, that, that I had bought it in New York, that it was a fake and whatever else. But they started looking at it. They were trying to find the difference between the $10 Rolex and the, you know, expensive Rolex. They could not, there was one difference that they found. But just if you were just look at those watches, you could not tell a difference. It's the only difference. Papa's second hand went tick, 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 tick. And the doctor's was a smooth motion. That was it. That was the only difference that they could find between those two watches. Now, I'm sure there was a difference, but that was the only difference that they could see. How are you and I supposed to gauge what is the genuine article? How are you and I to know what is really genuine and authentic? The Bible talks about that all the time, right? The Bible talks about tons of people who claim the name of Jesus or who claim the name of the Lord and are very far from him. How are you to tell the difference between a person who is genuinely, authentically walking with the Lord and someone who just claims to be? Jesus says that on that day of judgment, there will be many people who will stand before him and say, Lord, Lord. He'll say, I never knew you. It seems that those people feel as if everything is right between them and the Lord. They feel like they are going to heaven and that their eternal destiny is secure, but they're mistaken. How can you be sure that your faith is authentic? How can you know if you have, are in some sort of delusion or if your faith is real and genuine? 
The book of 1 John answers that question, and we're not going to look at all of the book of 1 John, but what we want to focus on with this authentic series are five marks of authentic followers of Jesus Christ. If you were to take uh, the same way that, that, that Paul Paul and the doctor took that, those Rolexes and held them side by side, if you were to take a person who is a believer and a person who's not a believer, no matter who goes to church and who doesn't, no matter who, all, all those things, no matter who, who, seems to be, uh, who seems to be living right, who doesn't, all of those, if you were to take the, this person and this person and one's a believer and one's not, what marks would the believer have that the unbeliever doesn't have? It's important. That's what 1 John tells us. In fact, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, near the end of the book, he writes this. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Why is John writing this letter? So that you can have some assurances, you can have some evidences and proofs that you can know that you have everlasting life, that you know that you're an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to look at the first of those five marks. The title of the message today is Sensitive to Sin because the authentic believer, the authentic follower of Jesus Christ is going to be sensitive to the sin that is in their life. Think about that word sensitive for just a moment. Have you ever had a, a, a toothache maybe, had a, had an ulcer in your mouth, or had a spot that's tender, you've had a wound, you've, even if it's just as small as a paper cut, or maybe you've had a really major surgery and it's sensitive, and you bump that, and oh, the pain comes. So, some of you have maybe even had some sort of wound or injury to the point that, that the, the covers, if the, if the covers lay on it, it hurts. Painful because it's sensitive. All those nerve endings are going off, those sensors of pain. When the believer sins, it's not covered up, it's not hidden, it, it's not, it doesn't go unnoticed. When the believer sins, they are sensitive to sin because of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Let's read today from 1 John chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 5. It says, This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So let's talk for a bit about how we deal with sin. It's just, that's what we want to think about. How do we deal with sin? How do we approach it? What do we do with it? What are, what is, what's the way that the, the authentic follower of Jesus is going to deal with sin? How does a person who doesn't genuinely know him, what's going to be the difference between the two? First thing I want you to know about the authentic follower, authentic Christians are sensitive to the covering up of sin. You cover up sin, the believer is, is sensitive to that, is aware of it. And one problem that we have is, is to cover it up or even to deny that it exists. When you look at the passage that we just read, both verses 8 and 9 begin with this phrase, if we say we have no sin. Now, covering up our sin can happen in a couple of ways. So let's think about the different ways that we might do that. First of all, a person might take an attitude, this is typically not a believer, this is typically a person who's an unbeliever, is going to say, well, I mean, David, I'm human, so I have shortcomings and I have flaws, but sin, that's a strong word. David, what I believe is, I believe that people are basically good. I think that people deep down are good. And I think, I mean, I celebrate the human spirit. I mean, it's inspirational to me to, to think about how people overcome and the indomitable human spirit is amazing, David. And so I don't think that people are bad. I think that people are basically good. And 
And I mean, I may make some mistakes along the way, but it's certainly not, certainly not sin. It's certainly not anything that God's going to be angry about. Have you heard this kind of talk? It's a way to cover up the fact that you and I, at our core, are sinners. Adam Clark says, by supposing that we have no guilt, no sinfulness, and consequently no blood, no need of the blood of Christ as an atoning sacrifice. If we take that attitude that people are basically good, what do we need to be saved from? What is it that, why do we need salvation? Why do we need forgiveness for, for our sins if, we, if we're all good? That attitude is not what the Bible presents. We're very clear on what the Bible says. The verses that you would hear me pull out all the time are Romans 3.23, right? That all have sinned. That's a very clear one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Isaiah 64, it tells us that our righteousness are like filthy rags before him. Jeremiah 17 tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? Who can understand how evil the heart is? The Bible is very clear about our nature. I'm sure you've also heard people talk about the fact that, you know, when you think about our sin nature, you have, that's why you have to teach children to be good. We all know how to be bad. We all, from a very young age, even before we can talk, we learn how to be deceptive and to lie and to cheat to get what we want because at our very core, that's who we are. We have a sin nature. We sin because we are sinners. And if a person can't admit their own sinfulness, they will never become an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, you know, a simple way that we often talk about the plan of salvation, especially with children, is we, we use those ABCs, like in Bible school, and we talk about admitting our sin and believing on Jesus, confessing our sin before him. It, it, without that admitting, without recognizing that you're a sinner, there's no need for Jesus to save you. In fact, I remember very early on, Joseph responded in a vacation Bible school, and in and, and, and talking to Joseph, Joseph knew that Jesus died on the cross. And, Jesus, and he knew that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But that had nothing to do with him. He, you know, he, 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 he didn't recognize his own sinfulness. There was, he didn't realize anything that he needed to be saved from. And so if we say that we have no sin, that's one way of covering it up. Now, as I say that, those of you in the room that are believers are saying, well, that, David, that's not me. I mean, I don't believe that. I mean, I know that I sin. But there's some of you in the room, I know. There's some of you in the room that are saying, but now that sin, I would never do that. Th this thing over here, th that would never be me. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that every one of us in this room are capable of anything because we are all sinners. It is at our very core and at our very nature. You know, oftentimes you'll see people on TV in a, like a murder mystery kind of show, they'll ask this kind of question, do you think that person is capable of murder? Yeah, we all are. We all are capable of murder. The answer, the answer every time on that show, every, no matter what those people say, every time, everybody's a suspect. Everybody's a suspect because we're all capable, right? That is who we are. That is our nature. And so even as a believer, we can fall into that trap to say, I would never do that. If you say that you have not sinned, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That is who we are. But you know, there's another way we can cover up our sin. We can know our own sinfulness. We can even know that it is sin, but we deny it. We, we, don't, we don't show that to other people, you know. We, we put this front up to other people that we are not in the wrong, that we do no wrong. This sanctimonious kind of attitude that says, oh, I would not be caught dead. But the truth is, is that all of us have these deep, dark places in our heart that we often try to hide from people, but in the private places of our life, we nurture those same dark things. This is covering up our sin. The genuine believer in Jesus Christ is going to be sensitive. We all may do that, but 
the genuine believer in Jesus Christ is going to be sensitive to that and feel conviction when that happens. They're going to recognize that as something we shouldn't do. But we all have a tendency to do that because even after we're saved, we don't lose that sin nature. We still wrestle with the flesh. And so what do we want to do? We want to put on a good show for everyone, and to do that, we have to lie. Not me. Not me. I don't do that. And we put on this front in front of everybody. This, this casting crown song is that we come into this place, it's like a stained glass masquerade where everybody's happy and nobody's, nobody's a sinner. We don't do those things. Truth is, that's all of us. And we start by lying to everybody else. We know it about ourselves, but we lie to everybody else. And the problem with lying to everybody else is, is before long, you know what you begin to think about yourself? You begin to think that that lie is the truth about yourself. You begin to buy into the lie. And you begin to feel like this thing that you're doing is not wrong because you've justified it in some way for everybody else. And so when you start thinking about the kind of the process is, is that we lie to others and then we begin to believe the lie ourselves. And through that whole process, what we're lying to God about this. And the truth is he knows all of it. The genuine believer, the authentic follower of Jesus Christ is going to be sensitive to that and is going to, and is going to be honest with the Lord. Because what verse 10 says is that if we deny our sin, if we are if we lie about it, cover it up, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us because what is his word? All of us are sinners and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All of our righteousness put together is like filthy rags. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. And if we deny that, we're making him a liar and his word is not in us. A genuine, authentic believer will not take that attitude. A gen, genuine, authentic believer is going to be honest about their sin. You see a person like David. Remember how David has the affair with Bathsheba and then lies to her husband and then kills her husband and then just goes about life like he's done nothing wrong. And he, through that whole thing, he's, he's lied to others and he has lied to himself and he's seemingly believing that because he's a little oblivious until Nathan confronts him. And when Nathan confronts him, then he has to get honest with everybody, right? He has to be honest about it. And so the genuine believer eventually is going to be honest about those things because Proverbs 28 and verse 13, the first part of that verse reads this way, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. And so if we're in this room today thinking that there's something that we're not capable of, if we're in this room today thinking that we're not, we make some mistakes, we have some shortcomings, but it's really not that bad, then we don't understand the gravity of our sin and and his truth is not in us. The genuine believer in Jesus Christ is not going to cover up their sin. The genuine believer in Jesus Christ is also going to be sensitive when it comes to the issue of confessing our sin. So what happens with the cover-up is that in the cover-up, we admit that we we either deny that it exists or we don't want anyone else to see it. But instead of covering up our sin, what we should be doing is confessing our sin when it becomes known to us. We may put blinders on. We may lie to ourselves. Our flesh may may cause us to, to go for a time and not understand the gravity of what we've done. But the whole time, we should be listening, and the Holy Spirit is getting our attention because the Holy Spirit is living within us. And when the Holy Spirit reveals to us as genuine, authentic followers of Jesus our sin, the thing we should do is not cover it up but confess it to him. In 1 John 1, in verse 9, that verse says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That is the prescription. That's the attitude that we should take toward our sin. A while ago, I read Proverbs 28 and verse 13. I just read the first half of that verse, but I want those guys to throw up the whole verse this time. And notice what the whole verse says. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Don't cover it up. But he who confesses and forsakes them, leaves them behind, will obtain mercy. What a great verse. What a great verse to parallel to this. That when we as believers recognize our own sinfulness, 
The thing for us to do is to bring it to the Lord, not to cover it up, but acknowledge it to God and allow him to, to cleanse us because he's the only one who can. If we deny the reality of our sin, it's a proof that we're not a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. In fact, I would say that continual confession of sin is a mark of a believer because the Holy Spirit is reminding you, hey, you messed up right there. And what do we do? We bring that to the Lord. You see, in our sin, apart from God, without the Holy Spirit, that conviction is not there. But when he saves us, when we are regenerated, when our eyes are open to understanding what we are, and we see our, we see God's, our filthiness in light of God's holiness, we bring that to him. When you think about the moment, like Brian was describing in the video, you think about the moment that you came to Christ, when those moments happen, he is opening our eyes and we are coming to him, we are confessing our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. The next day, we fall short. What do we do about that sin? We confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all. Two weeks later, we mess up. We confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all. Fifty years later, we stumble. We confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us. Con- continual confession of sin is a mark of a genuine believer. Look at that phrase for just a minute, too. If we confess our sins, let's talk about let's talk about some Greek a little bit here because these words are important. The Greek word for sin that is there, harmartia, is just a, a general word for sin, um, a general word for a mess up. And you've probably heard this before that that word there is to miss the mark. Right, so in, in other places, in in um, in other Greek writing, you might find it where a warrior strikes at an opponent and misses, fires the arrow and misses. Um, it would uh, in other places in 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 Greek writing, you would find it where a person, where a traveler, would miss the road. They they would miss their turn. They missed the mark. They missed where they were aiming. And so, in this way, it's a very general word. But the way that the New Testament uses this word for sin, when you think about the gravity of that sin and how we're missing the mark, it's not just that we're missing a turn. It's not just that we didn't hit the bullseye. The idea is we have, we have broken the law of the cosmic king of the universe. There's some gravity there. We have missed the mark when it comes to the moral standard that God has set. And there's gravity to that. And what does he ask us to do in that verse? He asks us to confess that to him. The word confess is in Greek is homo logeo. Listen to that word. Homo logeo. Homo. Same. That prefix is a same. Kind of is, is the word same. Think about logeo. Uh, logos. The word Logeo is like saying. So literally, confess is same saying. Confession of your sin is saying the same thing about your sin that God says about it. It's not just a little white lie. It is falsehood, and God is truth, and we have sinned against him. See what I'm saying? It's agreeing, God, this thing is not just a little thing to be passed over God, it is an offense to you, and I'm recognizing it for what it is. I'm not going to soften the blow. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to hide it or cover it up. I, I have missed the mark of the cosmic king. I have not hit your moral standard. You are disgusted by it. And therefore, because I'm an authentic follower of yours, and I'm devoted to yours, it disgusts you, and so it disgusts me, and I want to be rid of it. And Lord, I'm coming to you because you are the only one who can rid me of this. This is what it is to confess our sins. And the Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Because, and that's why we love Jesus so much, right? He's our advocate. He's the one who stands in the gap for us. He's the one who, who brings that to the Father. He's the one who has made our forgiveness possible through his death, burial, and resurrection. When you think about this verse, what we find in 1 John 1, 9 in confessing our sins when the believer recognizes that that's what's happening in our life, to confess it to him is the, is the natural next step for the authentic believer 
in Jesus Christ. And as I said, it's continual. It happens over and over again. The way I was describing it before, when you, on the day that you were saved, maybe the day you've got written in the front of your Bible, when you think back to the moment that you came to Christ, you were forgiven of your sin. And there is no more condemnation for sin for the believer. There's no condemnation for sin, right? Jesus bore your sin on the cross, and there's no condemnation for that. The penalty for that has been paid. And so the day that you came to Christ, you experienced kind of like this um, judicial forgiveness. Like in, 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 in you were made, you were declared clean because of his righteousness imparted to you, and he sees you as clean based on that, right? But after you're a believer, when you, when you have sin in your life, the problem is personal. It's relational. When you sin as a believer, it, it interferes with your relationship with him. And so when you come back to him confessing your sin, you're apologizing for that. You are making that right with him. And then what's happening is you don't have to be saved all over again. You understand? To sin is not to lose your salvation. As a believer, what we're doing when we're confessing our sin is we're agreeing with our sin, uh, to, with God about our sin, and we're, we're coming to him in order that this personal relationship might be restored. If you're here today, though, and you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, judicially, you stand guilty before him. Judicially, you, you have to answer for all of that sin. You've been writing checks that you can't cash. And, and, and apart from Jesus, we stand there with our, I mean, we stand there with our pockets out. I have nothing to offer. I have no way to pay this debt. No way. And it is only by the blood of Jesus that we are able. That is how the forgiveness of our sins happens. And it is true that he forgives us. And I believe, I believe 1 John 1, 9. I believe that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. But let me just point out before we move from here. Some people look at First John 1, 9 and think that gives you some sort of license to sin. You know how, we, you know how we'll say things like, it's, better to ask, you know, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, you know? And we think, well, I'll just take that attitude with God too, see? I'll just do what I want to, and then when I mess up, I'll just go to God because, you know, the Bible says, David said, he's faithful and just to forgive us. What an abuse of the amazing grace that God has given. The genuine follower of Jesus Christ, the authentic follower of Jesus Christ, does not look at 1 John 1, 9 like some sort of loophole of grace. If we are devoted to him, we're devoted to him. And so anything that is offense to him becomes an offense to us. Because of, our, because of our relationship to him, we should see it the same way that he says it. Because he has filled us with his Holy Spirit, because he has made us a new creature in Christ Jesus, now our attitude and vision towards sin has changed. And we don't look for how close we can get to the line without going over. We don't cross the line and then say, well, I know he's going to forgive me because we're devoted to him. I'm capable of cheating on Amy. Amy. She knows that. Hey, newsflash, she's capable of cheating on me too. It's really quiet. Y'all are okay with that, right? I, guess, I don't know why it got so quiet, but it was very awkward for just a minute. But I'm devoted to her. And because I'm devoted to her, I, I don't seek opportunity. I don't, I don't cheat on her and say, well, I'm pretty sure she loves me and she's going to forgive me. If I did, she might. But that's not the point. The point is, I'm devoted to her. Devoted to each other. And in that devotion and that love, that love is what, that love constrains us. Right? In thinking about what happens with him, this is what he's calling us to do. To bring that to him and to say the same thing. To be grieved in our heart and to say the same thing about our sin that he does. John MacArthur says, confession of sin characterizes genuine Christians and God continually cleanses those who are confessing. Listen, 
Rather than focusing on confession for every single sin as necessary, John has especially in mind here a settled recognition and acknowledgement that one is a sinner in need of cleansing and forgiveness. And you bring that to him. As Brian said in his video, it's dying daily. It's taking up that cross and going up to Calvary every single day and dying to yourself and recognizing that just the same desperation you had when you came to Christ as a sinner in need of salvation is the same desperation that you come every single day to him as a follower who's in need of forgiveness. It's the same idea. The genuine, authentic Christian is going to be sensitive to sin in that way. Third thing, third way, that a a genuine follower of Jesus is going to be sensitive to sin is in the continuing of our sin, continuing in our sin. You see, it is true that a believer will sin. You know, we, we even talked about that last week as we thought about Abraham and messing up, messing up our testimony. The believer is going to sin. And when they do, they should confess that sin because of the recognition that the Holy Spirit is giving us through our regeneration and the conviction that he gives, we should confess that sin. The believer is going to sin, but the believer should not live a life that is patterned by sin. When we come to Christ, our life is no longer marked by those things. Even in Sunday school this morning, we read from 1 Peter chapter 2, and what does that begin with? Leave behind all malice and slander, and it's telling us to leave some things behind. When we came to Christ, we did that. All those New Testament epistles tell us to leave behind that life we have lived as an unbeliever, and now we are pursuing Christ, and there are certain things that we leave behind. Our life is now different. In our text for today, you see it in verses 5 through 7, because verses 5 through 7 start not by talking about sin, but by contrasting light and darkness. In, in this In this moral symbolism, light represents purity, light represents holiness, darkness represents sin and wrongdoing. And notice the passage tells us, the key phrase here is where it says in verse 7 that we walk in the light. If we walk in the light, walk is this word that's often used in the New Testament to talk about our conduct, our daily behavior, So when the passage says, walk in the light, it's not talking about a stroll in the sunshine, right? When it says to walk in the light, it's talking about that we live our lives every day reflecting the holiness of Christ. Are we going to mess up? Yes. Is that... But when people look at our life and all they think about is continual mess up after continual mess up, that may not be a believer, to walk in the light. There's so many expressions of that because what is conveyed in verses 5 through 7 is this union with him. Do you see that? Just look at a few phrases that are in that. It, the first, verse 5 uses the phrase, in him. In him, there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, in verse 7, we walk in the light. And so all of this can kind of goes with this idea of a fellowship and a union with Christ. The one who's devoted to him, the one who's walking in step with him, the one who's unified with him is going to walk in the light and the pattern of their life is not going to be darkness. Look at 1 John chapter 3. If you've still got your Bible open, just turn over probably a page. We're going to read another section that we're not going to pick up in a future week, but it's a great pairing with this. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 4. Notice what this verse says. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By the, Listen, this is so powerful. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil, Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Isn't that a powerful passage? 
What's amazing to me is how John says, it's pretty clear cut. A person who follows Jesus has been imparted the righteousness of Christ. And how will they live? Well, like the righteousness of Christ. A person who does not have that will behave in a sinful way. And it will be evident. It will be characterized by darkness rather than light. Notice in this passage that the passage is talking about the habitual practice of sin. It's talking about he who practices sinning, who practices lawlessness. John MacArthur says, Christians have a sin disposition and do commit and need to confess sin. But that is not the unbroken pattern of their lives. A genuinely born-again believer has a built-in check or guard against the habitual sinning due to the new nature. Christ has given us the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, and we walk in him. As a Christian who walks in the light and who abides in him, this is the guard to, to prevent deliberately disobeying God's word. A person who, an unsaved person, even if they profess to be a Christian, but has a counterfeit life, will, their life will be marked by habitual sin. And I'm going to tell you the problem with that is there are so, the reason why this kind of study is so important is there are so, we need to examine ourselves because there are so many people who name the claim of who name claim the name of Christ but their coworkers would not identify with them with Christ their coworkers would say they are the furthest thing from Christ their family members that they live in the same house with would say they are nothing like Christ and you know what Christians are they're Christ like. And so if we are going to work and if we're at home and we're at the store and we're at the ball field and we're not behaving like Christ, that should be a gigantic red flag that whatever aisle we walked and whatever prayer we prayed and whatever decision we made could very possibly have nothing to do with Jesus because he's not in our life, because our life is not characterized by righteousness. And this affects those around us who do not know Christ, who need the gospel. I was in a conversation with somebody this week. This is what they were saying. They said, I have two family members. I have one family member who never misses church. He's always there. He's always quoting the Bible to people. And he is mean as a striped snake. And I have another family member who's a man of integrity, Who's a, who, who morally is a good person and is upright, who never goes to church, and he needs Jesus. But he sees this other family member break the Bible out on him and beat him over the head with it like a club and not act like Christ at all, and it's a real stumbling block for this man who needs Jesus. Based on everything that I've heard, I don't, I don't know the people, but based on everything I've heard, this first person that I'm describing, even though he's in church every Sunday, he is not an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. Because John says, it will be evident. It will be evident because a person's life will look like righteousness. It will look Christ-like. It's not. It's not. Real, Wycliffe commentary that I was reading this week said, righteous deeds spring from a righteous character, and they are the proof of regeneration. And so the fact that so many people claim Christ and yet do not behave like Christ to a world that needs him is all the more reason that we should think about what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus and be sensitive to the sin that's in our life. And if you're a genuine follower of Jesus, you will not continue in your sin. There will be fruit in your life keeping with repentance. There will be something in your life that looks different because of Christ. Our, our Sunday school lesson this morning said that we are sojourners and exiles in this world. Sojourners and exiles stand out. They don't look like everybody else. As a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, it should be authentic and stand out. And, and we will not continue in our sin. As a believer, you may fall into sin, but you will not walk in it. As a believer, you will walk in the light because you're abiding in him and he's the light. It will be evident to those around us. The genuine believer will be sensitive to sin and will not continue in it. Believers don't cover up their sin. They don't walk in it. They confess it because the believer knows how devastating sin is in your life. The believer doesn't make light of sin because little white lies and little sins are not a thing. 
We, we may have them broken down into our mind. That, that's a little thing. Or we may say that doesn't have as many consequences in the short term as this one. It's all sin. And the believer knows the devastating results of, of sin in a life. We know that a, that a little leaven messes up a whole loaf. 1945, the United States Navy was, was, trying to, um, was trying to get the first digital computer functional. This digital computer as big as a room, you know? All this huge computer, trying to get this first computer going. And at some point, the, the computer just stops functioning. And they can't figure out what's, what's happening, what's, what's going on. And, and it takes a, a lot of examination. When they finally break the thing apart, and they're getting down to the nitty-gritty of it, there's a moth that has climbed inside all the machinery, and it's preventing a circuit from closing. They took the moth out, and the computer goes. Today, that's, that's where we get our term. You know how we'll talk about that a software has a bug? It's where that terminology comes from. This little thing shut the whole thing down. And the believer knows that there's no big and there's no little because even the smallest of things is an offense to a holy God. The Bible says that that if you have broken just one of these commandments, you've broken them all. If you're dangling from a cliff by a rope, how many times do I have to cut the rope before you fall? Just once. When we think about our sin, think right now for just a moment about how you, your own attitude towards sin. I'm going to ask you to bow your head, and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment, and I want you to think about how you deal with sin. Because the way you deal with sin will, is one factor to determine whether you are an authentic follower of Jesus Christ or not. As we've looked at today, the genuine follower of Jesus Christ will experience conviction over their sin through the, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, and they will confess that sin to him. Is that what you do? Do you cover up your sin? Do you think you're above it, or do you think that it's... Do you think that you're some sort of exception to the rule? Do you actively try to shield and hide and stow away things that other people don't know about, but things you nurture in private? With your own attitudes, with your own thoughts, you nurture it. Do you cover up your sin? Can you, can you think about confessing it? Do you, as, as you, have, can you go back to a moment in your life where you said, God, I'm a sinner, God, I know I'm a sinner, and God, I'm in need of your forgiveness. Can you go back to that moment and then to determine if you have that moment, to determine if that moment was genuine, do you confess your sins continually? When the Holy Spirit reveals your sin to you, do you experience conviction of your sin? See, the, the, the person who's not an authentic follower of Jesus Christ has, is, is very neutral. They don't, feel, they don't feel that way about their sin. Now listen, they may have a guilty conscience because they, they do something that their parents taught them not to do, but conviction is from the Holy Spirit. Do you experience conviction over your sin in a way that's not just logical or rational, but is divine? Do you feel the compulsion to to confess and to to, to go to God and ask forgiveness for that? Do you feel compelled to go to other people and ask forgiveness for that? Are you sensitive to the sin that's in your life? Are you you continuing in your sin right now? Because a a genuine believer would be very sensitive to that. They would recognize that their pattern of life can't be marked by wrongdoing. When people think about you, what do they think? What would your coworkers say of you? What would your family say of you? What would your neighbors say of you? What would the people that you go to school with, what would they say about you? Is your life defined by you walking in the light? 
or by you walking in the darkness? What is the general practice of your life? Righteousness or unrighteousness? These are all just like a litmus test. And John says it's evident. Listen, you may be here this morning and you may have never trusted Christ as your Savior. And for the very first time as you sit in the service, you have never been more sensitive to your sin than you are right now. The Holy Spirit has opened your eyes and you recognize, David, if I don't, if I don't do something about this today, if I don't respond to Jesus today, I would have been disobedient to the Holy Spirit who's calling me right now. If that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to come and let me get someone who can walk through God's word with you and, and introduce you to Jesus, can, can show you how you can walk in the light, how you can abide in him. Maybe you're here today and, and you, you can go back to a moment in your mind, but your life is not marked by Christ. And maybe you have questions or doubts about that moment. Listen, I'm not preaching this message to create doubts. This series is not about creating doubts. I believe so firmly in the power of the Holy Spirit that I believe that if, if you are a believer sitting here under the sound of my voice, the Holy Spirit will confirm in you that you are sensitive to sin. But if you are not, the Holy Spirit will also convict you of that too. Lord, this morning as we're here, we may have come in with lots of things on our mind. But Lord, our sin is an offense to you. And so Lord, if you have brought something up to our mind right now, Lord, I pray that we would bring it to you, agreeing with you about what that thing is. That it carries the sentence of death in your word. A death that your son came and willingly took for us. Lord, I pray that you would make us sensitive today to be obedient to your will. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.